Praise the Lord. We'd like to thank you for watching us on this Wednesday night, our midweek service. We ask that God would bless you, and I know there's been so many things going on, and I just pray that you find the joy in all this time of things that are happening, but that God's blessing is going to be upon you. And uh, soon and very soon, Lord willing, we'll get back to our normal life. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to attend church again on a regular basis. And so we just pray and continue to pray that God will intervene and that God will bless and God will restore and God would help us at this time that we're going through. So be encouraged, be steadfast, be blessed for God's glory to be upon you and your family and your loved ones. And so we've been studying and going through the Bible and we've been studying the book of James. I was asked uh, by some of our church members uh, if I would teach the book of James. Margie, in fact, asked me. And so we started the book of James, and it's been a blessing. And I've been trying to do some of the uh, first part of it, you know, and trying to bring it all together so that we can understand more. How James speaks to us so that we understand truly the clarity of of the, the book of James, how it was written. I did the introduction last week and who he is and when, how, and when, all these things had taken place and the dates and all that. I gave out all that information out last week. And how James was so blessed as he found himself now as the Lord's brother and knowing the responsibility that he felt within his heart, the purpose within himself of the things that he wanted to accomplish and the things that he wanted to do. James, automatically, the church was going through a horrendous time in Jerusalem. And he knew the people were struggling. And they were going through a season in their life that was really difficult. And James opens up as he begins to share with us, to tell us his greeting. And he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't open up by saying, James, the Lord's brother. He didn't say that. He felt that to himself, maybe he wasn't worthy because of all that he had seen, all the denial that he had made previous. But now he opens up by saying, James, a servant, a douloid, a bondservant of the Lord God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the 12 tribes among the nations, the 12 tribes that were scattered throughout the nations, Remember, this is the time when the Lord began to, to move and, and Paul the Apostle begins to share with them that the Gentiles were now coming in and they were being a part of this new movement of the Holy Spirit and what the Lord God was doing. So it was something new that was happening in the transition of the church being birthed like it wasn't before that. Before it was a the 12 tribes, the animal sacrifices, and all those other things, the Sabbath day and circumcision, all those things were re really important to them. But when the Lord came and He began to move by the power of the Holy Spirit, He began to share about the grace, the love, the, the knowledge of God, the, the blessings that He had for us, to understand that we were called in a different way. We were called under grace, chorus in the Greek, that we were called to be servants of the Lord God, truly to be introduced to Jesus Christ. So it was something that was happening between James and Paul and Peter at the time of this newness that was coming in. These people that were one at one time barbarians to them, now they were a part of them. 
they had received the Holy Spirit like they did. They began to speak in tongues. And Peter, when he went to the house of Cornelius, saw the outpouring of the Lord God as those that were there, these Gentiles, all of a sudden received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were blessed. And so Peter could not deny what he was seeing. And he knew that what they experienced in the upper room in the book of Acts, now the Gentiles had received it as well. Peter goes back to make his report of what was taking place, of what he experienced and what he was able to see. And to this surprise, as he said, God has called these people. God has called them and there's something going on and it is a new move. And it's a movement that's tremendous. At that same time, Paul the Apostle was being raised up. And God was beginning to bless Paul. God touched Paul as he was going to eradicate the church, which was known as the way at the time, and going to Damascus to destroy the church. God called him. God spoke to him. And God began to raise up Paul the Apostle, this rebel. Paul, the little one. And yet Saul was his birth name, which meant destroyer. And he was a destroyer at the time, and God gave him the name of Paul later on. But he was on the way to Damascus to destroy and eradicate the church of Jesus Christ. With letters of approval from the Sanhedrin, from the Jewish priests and all that was going on. And at that time, the Lord intervened. The apostles knew that Judas had hung himself. And Judas no longer was one of the apostles, of course. So they said, we're going to bring and we're going to re-elect someone to be the 12th apostle. So they elected a person by the name of Matthias. And Matthias was going to be the 12th apostle to them. But the Lord already had picked the man that he wanted. And he picked up Paul, the apostle. And one of the prerequisites at that time, in order for you to be an apostle of the Lord... You had to see him. You had to talk with him. So in order for you to be a a person that could say, I saw the Lord. I'm an apostle because he touched me. Matthias had not experienced that. Matthias had not experienced that one-on-one with the Lord. He did not share with him. But Paul did. Paul saw him. He says, is that you, Lord Jesus? And the Lord spoke to him. Why are you persecuting me? And the Lord began to speak to him over and over, even while he was blind and he had shackles and he was, you know, his eyes had scales on him. And even though he was blind and all that was going on within his life, yet God was speaking to him. He was breaking and remolding him and blessing him and preparing him for the journey ahead of him that he would be one of the greatest apostles that we would ever know. Paul knew that the Lord had called him to be an apostle of grace. Apostle of love and understanding. So when the Lord picked him and used him for his glory, there was no denial of what God was doing. So when he spoke to Peter, he told Peter, these apostles that are there that don't believe what God is doing, he says, I want you to see firsthand. Peter got to experience in Galatia and in, in the city of Galatia. He went in there and he began to see what the movement of God. He begins to see the freedom and the blessings, but they wanted to say, okay, we'll, we'll accept the Gentiles. We'll accept them, but they got to keep the Sabbath day and they got to keep the circumcision and we'll accept them. And James was a part of that. And Paul, the apostle says, no way, no way. They're under grace. They're not under the law. They were still dealing with the 12 tribes. Well, Paul was dealing with all the Gentile churches and all the Gentiles that were coming in, every nationality and race that was coming in to be blessed. So there was totally different what he was doing. And he let them know, no, no longer are we going that route. And so as the book was established and as they began to see and James began to learn and they saw the outpouring of support from the Gentile churches as Paul had gone through Asia Minor and picking up money to come back because Jerusalem was having a recession and the church was going under in Jerusalem and Paul picked up an offering from all the churches and was able to bring it and to Jerusalem. This is the work of my labor. These are the the brothers that have come together. 
These Gentiles that are now believing in Jesus Christ and understanding the glory of God. And they began to see something that God was doing. And never had they seen this before. And the blessings that were arising. So they were able to understand more and more of the movement that God was doing. And, and Peter was out there reporting back to James and the rest of the apostles of what was taking place. The blessings, the miracles, the signs and wonders. The blessings that were occurring under the name of Jesus. And, and how Paul was moving and and people are being blessed and saved all over the place because of that new fresh anointing that he was doing. And they began to understand and adapt, especially when they received the offering. They began to see the work that God was performing before them as a witness to them and as a testimony. So when James opens up and he says to the 12 tribes abroad, to those that have been struggling, to those that have been called, to those that are in Asia Minor and all around. He says, greeting, shalom to all of you for what you're going through. But at the same time, for the Gentiles, their understanding of what was taking place. Here's James, the Lord's half-brother, that now is realizing what is going on. Little by little, he's adapting to it, and he's accepting more and more of what's happening with the Gentile church. And the blessings and knowing what they were doing and, and how God had inspired them and how God was blessing them. And he begins by saying, consider it pure joy, verse 2. Notice, my brethren, wherever you, whenever you face trials of many kind. That means there's so many different things that go on. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking in anything. That perseverance changes us as we grow and find maturity and growth and stability. Evaluating our own lives, examining our own hearts and saying, Lord God, but the sad part about it that I see so many believers that have come to know the Lord and they don't have a lasting relationship with the Lord. They come and after a year, two years, five years, they're back into the world. Instead of applying themselves and knowing what God is doing and the calling of the Lord, the influence of God, the blessings of God, that He wants to show them and mature them so that He can give them more, so they can understand more. To whom much is given, much more is required. And that's why, as we find the brokenness that God is dealing with us, to take us out of the old man and bring us into the new man, so that we can experience these trials and tribulations, that we can be victorious through the time of calamity and adversity, that we can grow and be mature, that we would be a voice to others and be the conduit of God to help those that are struggling, to those that need encouragement, to those that need a touch from God or a word of encouragement with love and security and strength so they would be strong in everything that, that they look at and, and they begin to grow and then they begin to help out others as they're discipled, as they begin to be discipled by these brothers and sisters and they begin to launch out and those other people begin to disciple and the word of God begins to spread like wildfire and the blessings of the Lord. That's how the church was birthed. That's how God began to do all the things that he's doing. There is nothing new under the sun. What they experienced, we're experiencing it today. But in a different way, of course. But nevertheless, we are experiencing trials, tribulation, problems, financial problems, health problems. We struggle with temptation. We struggle with all the things that they were struggling with. There was nothing new under the sun. But yet he was talking to us about walking wisely before God. Walking and understanding the relationship that we have. How we can be mature in a time of trials and tribulation. How we can be strong and victorious at the same time. How we can run the mountaintops of glory and victory and power. And knowing that God is with us. That temptation is difficult. But for so many Christians, when they feel that they're, 
going through the time and a season in their life that is difficult, sometimes they acquaint that and say, well, maybe God is punishing me. Maybe God is displeased with me. And that's where discernment comes in. That's when we begin to discern who is God and what is he doing with you? How is your relationship with the Lord? How much have you grown since you've been saved? Do you know the Lord? For so many that were called and, and they were truly anointed and blessed and, and excited and moving for God with a zeal that was tremendous and how they were trying to touch so many lives. Now they find themselves sitting on the shelf doing nothing but collecting dust. We're no longer effective. We're no longer reaching out to the lost or the hurting. No longer are we touching lives. We're just existing. And God wants us to see those trials and tribulations that we go through are not necessarily placed there to stumble you or to correct you or to harm you. But sometimes they're placed there for us to grow and find the maturity. How do I act under pressure? How can I endure? So that way God can take you to another level in your walk with God. And finding the maturity to be able to deal. And finding your calling in the Lord. And finding your purpose in how to serve God. Because until purpose is discovered within your life, Existence has no meaning because purpose is the fulfillment of our life and how we follow the Lord, how we desire Him, how we love Him, how we want to serve Him. So sometimes we look at being broken as something that's too difficult for us, but we walk wisely before God, asking God for His eternal blessing, asking God for deliverance. Asking God to show us the way so that we can walk in that road of difficulties at times. He tells us to prepare ourselves. Walk wisely. Consider these tribulations that come against you. Consider the problems. The church was under siege. The Romans were against them. The Jews were against them. And the tribe that scattered those that were saved. They were scattered. They were fearful. And they were running for their life. And James writes them to encourage them to help them in this time of adversity. This time of persecution that they were under. The problems that were existing at that time. To give them strength. Hopefully that they would stand victorious and find the will of God in their life. And James shares with them about walking wisely before God. Find your way through the maze of life. You're not walking alone because He's with you. So have you ever thought about that? How, how do you walk your walk? What are you going through? How do you live your life through these trials and tribulations of today? They are different. We have the internet. We have television. Things that even cause more stumbling blocks for so many believers. There's so much temptation through television, the internet, the things around us that weren't there before. But today, they're prevalent. They're everywhere as you look at things going on. So when we look at trials, our trials are a little bit different. They take away the joy of God and bring in temptation. It wants to lure us away from the Lord. But God's perspective in living wisely is saying you have a choice. And I have a choice. A choice to do the will of God or a choice to walk against the will of God. You have a choice to say I'm going to dig in. I'm going to walk wisely. Not unwisely, but wisely before you, Lord God. I want to be a fragrance to you and not an odor, Lord God. I want to be a blessing to you. I want you to touch me and bless me and rejuvenate me and help me, Lord God, to be strong so I can do your will, so I can bless others. Because it's difficult. You find yourself struggling at times with your thoughts and how you look at things. And controlling your thoughts is a big deal for all of us. 
It's, it's mind over matter. You got to say no. No is no. With temptation. How many believers go back into the world to drugs? How many believers go back into the, the world with liquor? How many go back into pornography? How many go back into their old lifestyle? And yet God says, no, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and behold, all things become new to the glory of God. That we walk wisely knowing. So controlling our thoughts and asking God, do you find yourself wondering? And sometimes it's dangerous because it takes you to a zone that you don't want to be in. And you find yourself struggling there. It seems like at times you have no, no willpower. But those are trials that we face. Not necessarily trials of persecution. Our persecution is a heart of what the Holy Spirit tells us. How the Holy Spirit convicts us of the trials that we go through. These people were under a different type of persecution. But nevertheless, trials have a way of stretching you. They have a way of, of making you wonder about your life and all the blessings that God desires. And so we are we need to be careful that we're not wandering into a, a troubled zone, a dangerous zone that's going to lure us away from the glory of God. In that zone that we're leaving our, and we're walking into a, a comfort zone that is not for us, we are to launch out. We're to be a weapon for the Lord. Because there, there is lust. There is worry. There's anxiety. There's envy there. There's fear. There's rage. And rejection. And God is looking to bless you with the gifts of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, patience, endurance. And overcoming the wiles of the enemy. Those are the gifts. That's the zone that God wants us in. That zone of maturity. That zone of grace. That zone of growth. That zone that is of maturity. Not walking in the flesh. Not walking in that zone that is our own comfort zone. That there we go back into our old lifestyle. See, we, we have to be careful that we're not engaging into those things once again. You know, it penetrates your dreams, your ideas, the things that you want, how you practice your daily walk with God, your devotions, your love, your prayer life, your commitment. How do you view the things that God is desiring for you to find that maturity? I must separate myself. Jesus said that you're haggois, you are separated for the kingdom of God. That there's other things that God has called you so that you would walk in victory and power that people could see the glory of God in you. Because we're, we're being transformed daily by the glory of God. And, and it's a daily practice of what I'm doing to find my way through the maze of temptation, through the maze of weakness, through the maze of trials and tribulations and doubt. Is this God or is it, do I have discernment? Is it not God? Is it God? And we wonder and we ask ourselves these questions. That's part of growing. That's part of maturity. And yet we got to ask ourselves, because a few months ago, you would have never dreamed of doing what you're doing now. But we yield and we fell. And that's the time to get up and say, no, 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 no. This is a bad place for me to be. It's not a place of security. It's not a place of love. It's not a place of understanding. I got to realize that the battleground is my mind. The battleground for us is control. Control that I want to do what God called me to do. That's my walk with Christ as a Christian. To walk according to the will of God. So the fight that I have and the battles that, I ra that are raging against me. They're either won or lost in the mind. And how you develop and how you surrender and how you submit. But the battle's all fought up here. And how you control your thoughts. And how you say, no, Lord God, help me by the power of the Holy Spirit. The inner man has to stand up. 
and say, no way, I don't want that. I'm not going to go that route. The temptation is not going to have a foothold on my life. I've got to pray and ask God for strength, for God's will to be in my life and not mine. These are the trials that are different for us, but nevertheless, they're trials that can overtake you. They're trials that can control you. They're trials that can stumble you and lure you away from the growth and stability and the blessings of what God wants to do in your life and the joy and the victories that God wants to give you, the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit as you begin to grow and find that maturity. Our inner man is constantly wrestling and battling with the thoughts that go through their, through their minds. The devil never rests. He wants to attack our, our thought pattern. He wants to attack us any way he can. Satan comes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he wants to devour us. He wants to take us back into the world. He wants us to stumble. And he brings assaults against us and combines them and acting like as though everything is okay when it's not and we understand that. We must understand that we have to continue and go forward. That we are being transformed every day. Every day we're facing new challenges, but every day we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit, by the work of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Of finding the joy and yet knowing that I'm having victory over the problems that, that are facing me because I know the Spirit of God, I know the power of God, and I want to fight and I want to walk victorious for the kingdom of God because I want to represent Him. The glory of knowing the Lord, being transformed by the Spirit of God. We are not automatically given all this when we just say that I want to be a Christian. You know that... We're being reprogrammed as the Lord has given us new software, if I can use that terminology, every day in our life. The things that He's showing us, the things that we're growing, and that new software is being renewed every day. So we must be programmed daily by the power of the Holy Spirit, programmed by the Word of God, programmed by prayer, and finding the power that we need through prayer, through the Word of God, as you do your devotions, as you look at God and you begin to see that the Spirit of the living God is touching you, as you read the Word of God, as you begin to grow, as you begin to pray and exalt the Lord and say, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be comfortable, Lord God. I want to do your will. You've called me, Lord God, and I want to serve you more than ever. I don't want to be comfortable. We live in a system that's controlled today. By the enemy. We know that evil lurks all around us. So we must have our, our gear on. We must have all of our weapons to fight at the armor of God constantly. So that we can fight against the wiles of the enemy that's coming to bombard us. Every day he wants to make you stumble. He wants to take you like a trophy. That he conquered your life. And parade you in front of people. To show and try to say, look what I've done to your servant, Lord God. And yet we're bombarded with all kinds of things. Materialistic things. Things that we look at. Sexual programs. Things that we shouldn't be looking at. Our thought pattern being assaulted every day. And yet, God is asking for holiness. God is asking for power and obedience. Obedience and knowing the Lord through trials and tribulations. And it's not always a thought and saying, God is against me. Sure, you're going to stumble. We all stumble. We're not perfect. But by the same token, you get up and you say, Lord God, here I am. I'm not going that route. Everybody stumbles. That is a part of human nature. We're not going to be perfect until we're with Him. Until we are with Him. Until that time... We're in the battle zone. We are fighting. We are trying to protect ourselves. We're coming against these shots that are coming against us, the flaming arrows, torpedoes, missiles, whatever you want to call them. They're coming against us to stumble us, to disqualify us, to take us out of the will of God. 
And we're fighting this all day long because we know the battle that is raging against us. We're mature enough to understand those battles that are coming against us and we stand strong and mature for the glory of God because we know that we need obedience in order for God to move. So how do we control our thinking pattern? How do we look at such hostile environments that we're, that we're in and the things that we're seeing? And yet, it's opposite of whatever God tells us. It's the opposite. God always says, it's, this is the truth. This is the power. But yet, the enemy always tries to make it something negative. The Apostle Paul knew exactly what we were going through. He understand. He understood the things that were happening because he was initiating something new. He was bringing in the grace of God. He was giving us something that had never been here before. Then now we had a relationship and the Holy Spirit was inside of us. Tabernacling inside of us. That we became the temple of God. Not a building. Not a structure. But the Lord himself that came into us. And it was essential for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And to experience the supernatural power of God. So that we can walk in victory and power. Walk in that victory. The glorious blessing that God wants to give us. That wonderful, wonderful gift of discernment. Knowing what is the will of God in my thought pattern. Knowing what God desires. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, but your will, Lord God. So I share with you tonight, set your mind on things above for the glory of God. Not on the things of the earth that are going to stumble you. They're going to short circuit what God is doing. Do not be deceived and think that you're exempt from any of this. All of us are under fire. All of us are finding ourselves struggling with problems that we understand What may be my weak point may not be yours. And what may be yours, it may not be for me. But there's something there that the devil is throwing. Something that's innocent. Whether it's money. Whether it's power. Something that he's doing. And you always have to be alert. And know that he's out like a roaring lion. When that thought comes into your mind, rebuke it. Eject it. Expel it. Rebuke it and say, no way, Jose. In the name of Jesus, I'm covered with the blood. I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. And we understand that we're under fire. But my relationship with the Lord is greater. And I understand success is going to come when I yield and I surrender to the Lord. So we must answer the Lord and answer the call. To God, that He can use us to reach the loss and the hurting for Him. As we go through the trials of life, how do you answer that? How do you respond to God? If I asked you today, what are you living for? What are you living for? Do you know your purpose? Do you know what God has called you to do? Are you doing it? Are you fulfilling the will of God in your life? Or have you become a procrastinator? Have you become lazy? Are you full of excuses and not walking for the glory of God in victory? Has the devil come into your playground and destroying what God intended for you? What would you say? What would be your answer? Is it something spiritual or something of the world? The Bible tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness will be added unto you. His righteousness will be added unto you. The glory of God, the blessing of God, with that breath of fresh air, no matter what warfare you're in, You'll have the victory in Jesus Christ 
as God begins to bless you, as, be God, as God begins to touch your life, and you begin to understand the trials and the tribulations around you. This was something that I wanted to share with you, to open up on that. I'm going to be talking about that for several weeks, about the temptation, about the things that happen to us under pressure before we move. We're going to study the book of James verse by verse and precept upon precept. We're going to dissect it. We're going to go through it and learn and be blessed together, asking God to show you. Hopefully that he'll give you that strength that you need and that encouragement to rise up and say, Lord God, I need you. I need you more than life, Lord. I'm not doing anything. I haven't touched anyone. No one has come to you. I haven't touched no one's life for a while. I haven't ministered to anyone. I have not said the sinner's prayer with anyone. I have not led anyone to you, Lord God. It's been a long time. My life has not been a fragrance, but it's been an odor. I need to get back. I need to get back and take back what the canker worm and the locust stole from you. Take it back in the name of Jesus. Let tonight be the beginning. Let tonight be a start for you to say, I've got to get back on track. I got to pick up my Bible again. I got to begin to read. I got to begin to pray and ask God to give me strength and deliverance. I got to begin to ask the Lord to show me his desire, not mine. So I can help my children. So I can be a blessing to others, my neighbors, my siblings, my parents, whoever. That you will be able to be an example and a blessing. That God will use you and find that purpose. It is so important that you find your purpose before the Lord. I love you in the Lord. And I pray that you take the book of James and read it. And hopefully we will meet next week. And be able to share more and more on the glory of God. And the blessing that God has. From all of us at Lake Hills, we love you. And we pray for you and your families and your loved ones, and we pray that God is going to just lift you up and strengthen you, that God is going to encourage you, and that God's going to give you a beautiful week this week, a week filled with blessings, I pray. And I pray as you sleep, you will dream dreams of the Lord as well. We love you in the Lord. We can't wait to meet you in person. Can't wait for us to get back into church and praise the name of Jesus and worship the Lord with power and tenacity. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace and give you strength and bless you like you've never been blessed before. May the blessings of the Lord overshadow you. May you be blessed in everything you do. May the Lord fill you with his joy. May the Lord fill you with his power. In the name of Jesus. Amazing grace. How sweet the song. How sweet the sound. That saved a wrench like you and me. I love you in the Lord. The Lord cover you in his blood and bless you. God bless you. See you next week. In the name of Jesus. We love you, we love you, we love you. Peace be with you. Vaya con Dios. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey.